Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Uh, before we start, again, uh, typical house rule, we just have to follow, uh, switch on, switch off your uh, microphone, please mute it. Uh, and then later on, we will be having our Q&A portion after the, after the presentation of our distinguished guest speaker for today. Or you might, you may type in your questions in the chat box uh, if those are urgent. Okay. So of course we do encourage you uh, to ask questions. Uh, uh, so we will have a, a very engaging session for today. Okay, so again, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we are fortunate to have our fourth distinguished speaker for the architectural design project lecture series two. Okay, of course, just to brief everyone, uh, the ADP lecture series is a platform to expose students okay, uh, to real world learning by engaging them to, to distinguish guest speakers' expertise through their design works, practices, philosophy, research interests, and advocacies. The lecture topics are aligned to the themes and focus of our studio. Okay, likewise, uh, in aid to inspire uh, in the development of the final project. Okay, we're also joined by our friends and some of the alumni and, and uh, students from other uh, studios, okay? So I think without uh, further delay, I'll just uh, make a quick introduction to our distinguished guest speaker, okay? Um, architect Wilson Singh received uh, his architectural education at the University of Nottingham and Oxford Polytechnic. Sorry about that. Um, Polytechnic in United uh, in UK. Upon graduation, uh, he worked in London till 1990. His registration with the Architects Registration Board, United Kingdom. He joined Sea Arch in 1994 and was appointed a director in 2000. Okay, Wilson is considerably. Uh, is, is very experienced, leading many award-winning projects of varying complexity and scale. This include the Damai Surya, Iringan, Hijau, Bel, uh, Belum, uh, Rainforest, and Six Ceylon. Okay, uh, Wilson, architect Wilson, stands in awe of nature, fascinated by how it develops an inherent design intelligence in its adaptation for survival and procreation. He believes that a parallel can be drawn with how project constraints and challenges uh, provide opportunities for adaptations to generate innovative design. Okay. This appreciation, along with his personal interest in painting, music, ceramics, serve as an inspiration to his work at Sea Arch. Okay. Without further ado and further delay, I would like to welcome everyone. Please welcome architect William Singh. Architect Wilson. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Prince. Um, okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me just put on my slide. Okay, can everyone see my slides? Yes. yes. Yep. Okay, good. Um, okay, so uh, poetics, or architectural pro poetics, yeah. Uh, it's a sort of big heavy word that uh, we talk about in design school, right? So actually when uh, Wei Cat approached me um, and we discussed topics for the lecture, um, I, I, I was sort of wondering, well, what, what did I have to say? You know, a sort of uh, practicing architect uh, in a very commercial world, yeah. And, um, you know, uh, as we say, Portex is, is usually reserved for the sort of famous, you know, for the Andos and all that. Um, but then I think after thinking and mulling over it, um, I was thinking that in this day and age, uh, the age of the sort of micro attention and, you know, the sort of... Uh, architecture porn, the sort of clickbait uh, internet syndrome that we have. Um, there's sort of many stuff that we see online uh, that is okay, you know, uh, picture perfect. Uh, 
but whether those those make good spaces or meaningful spaces, um, some you know leave much to be desired. So I thought, okay, uh, perhaps there's sort of something there that uh, I can do or I can share. And my my the purpose of my talk this afternoon is really to talk through uh, five projects that we've done. Okay, uh, to just show you. Uh, how or, how or what the thoughts are that sort of go into it. And then also to, uh, to see, you know, how we overcome, yeah, the usual issues in practice, yeah. So that's hence the talk that is uh, titled Poetics, but in practice, yeah, okay. So when we talk about poetics, yeah, um, I said, it really comes down to the, the root of it is, you know, something called phenomenology, right? Uh, a branch of uh, philosophy that started in the early 20th century. And it deals with uh, the study of consciousness and the structure of our experiences, yeah? And um, what I'm gonna do next is um, if I can so sort of get everyone's, uh, cooperation or can respond to this. I'm gonna sort of flash out uh, six different images, six different spaces, okay? And I'd I'll, I'll like everyone to just sort of put in two response, responses. One is that number one, um, have you been to the place? Okay, so just answer a why or and yes or no, yeah, number one. And number two, um, the actual lecture. Number two, do you think it's poetic? Okay, uh, don't worry, there's, there's no right or wrong answer. Okay, I just want to see your response, yeah. So this is uh, the Nordic Pavilion in the Venice Biennale, one of the permanent pavilions, yeah, in Venice. Okay, so can, can you, can people just sort of put in your response? Yeah, uh, have you been there, yes or no? And is it poetic to you, yes or no? Okay, anybody else? Okay. Okay, so quite a mixed bag, right? Okay, next one. Okay, I'll move on to the next one. Uh, this is in KL, okay, the Heroes Mausoleum in Amatjit Nagara. Uh, so it's not under the, big, the small roof. What do you all think of it? Okay. So a lot of yes poetics, yeah. Okay. And okay, I'll move on to the next one. Okay, so Zumthor's Field Chapel in Germany. Okay. This is something quite special. Uh, the interior of the building is formed from the bark of uh, trees, yeah, onto concrete. Oh, that's interesting. Looks like a bird's nest house. <laughs> okay, uh, one more. Okay. Uh, it's a reflective pool lobby uh, in the office block in Cyberjaya. Okay, so is it poetic? And have you been there? Okay, good. Okay, one more. This is the famous one, the favorite one. Okay, Ando's Church of Light in Japan. Hmm. 
Okay. And the last one, back home, this is the spiral staircase in Dewan Tunku Chancellor in University of Malaya. Okay. Okay, thanks for your response. Okay, we'll go through that in a minute, yeah. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, we see that number one, responses are quite varied, okay. Um, so it's, you could say it's quite subjective. Um, but secondly, also in all those images I showed you, uh, there was one sort of purely commercial project, yeah, the, the, the reflective pool lobby, okay. And that got the, the sort of most no's in terms of whether it's a poetic space, okay? So really all the nice spaces, it seems, are things that are chapels or churches or concert halls or museums, you know, uh, or things like that, okay? So is that true? Um, now what, if we want to, look at the poetics, okay? Uh, there isn't a checklist or a how to do poetics in architecture, but a good place to start is this, uh, this book here, okay? Uh, by Bachelard, okay? So Bachelard is also a philosopher from the early 20th century. And in this book, uh, he looks at our personal and emotional responses to different spaces in a house, right? He, so he dissects a house, different spaces in it, the attic, the cellar, a drawer, and the house itself, okay? And um, what he does is he goes on to encourage architects, okay, to base their work on the experience, the, the user experience, and, uh, you know, the sort of reaction that it will bring out from the users, okay? So not on abstract rationales or formal composition, okay? Um, and with that, okay, from your responses, okay, the house then he says begins to take on meaning, okay, so your responses will be based on your own personal uh, memories, your own personal experiences, your likes, your dislikes, your fears, okay, but through that um, process, okay, it then starts to give the house meaning, yeah? oh, okay. meaning, memories, emotions, in imagination, intimacy, the list goes on, okay? And here is then something which he then says, okay, you begin to touch on poetry, yeah, okay? Now, um, he also gives this very beautiful metaphor uh, that it says that in um, a sunflower seed, right, really contains the dream of the flower of the future, yeah? So the metaphor is then that, okay, in every space inside a, a, a building, okay, there is that dream of what the space could be to the user. So it's very much driven by, um, how do you say, the user's response to it. Okay. Hence, it can be very subjective, okay, right. So what is our response, I say, you know, uh, when, you, when you visit a space or, you know, see a piece of architecture, okay. Uh, there is also a, a very uh, common sort of philosophical question that says that if a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, okay, does it make a sound? Yeah. Um, and the answer to that actually is uh, no, okay, generally because sound is, is not just vibration in the air, sound is vibration in the air right, which is received into someone's ear on your eardrum and you perceive the sound. So in the same way, we talk about, uh, is it a poetic space? The user and the user's response is central to that, yeah? So that um, is basically the sort of key idea of what, what means to create poetic spaces, yeah? Okay, now, um, so, his thinking was really quite a radical departure from classical thinking. 
And when I say classical, yes, it starts with uh, Vitruvius, right? Classical Roman architecture, right? Uh, and it was, you know, basically termed as commodity, firmness, and delight. So, so much of modern architecture is also based on that. Commodity means use, uh, usefulness, okay? So does the space serve its function and does it serve it elegantly? Okay, firmness, is it well built? Uh, is the structure sort of expressed as it was? And delight, okay, that's where the art comes in. Uh, does it give you enjoyment and something to be uh, appreciated, you know, as you enter the space? So, you know, uh, martial art and phenomenology is really a radical departure from this, yeah. Okay, so um, we then say, is it architecture or is it architecture with a big A? Yeah, so that's what uh, we are sort of trying to discuss and sort of dissect this afternoon, okay? So um, as I said, um, however, when you're out in the field and you're practicing, okay, uh, reality is not so simple, yeah? Uh, unless you're a big superstar. And even then, yeah, we are always under pressure to build them high, okay? Uh, build them cheap, and so that our clients can sell them well. Yeah. Uh, we are under a lot of pressure in terms of time, in terms of meeting budgets, okay? So what, what does that, you know, um, what does that leave? Where does that leave us, yeah? Um, Added to that is that architecture, uh, in architecture, we work with a whole bunch of people, different people, yeah? And each one of them has uh, different perceptions of our role, okay? Uh, usually seen by the public as, you know, uh, someone a bit airy-fairy, yeah, in his own world, okay? Our clients see us as sort of, uh, lazy and not doing much, but always worrying about our fee account, okay? Um, the QS sees us as spendthrift people, okay? Spending the project money. Um, the planners, right, see us as insensitive, only interested in satisfying our ego by putting up our designs, yeah? The builder or the contractor thinks that uh, we are arrogant on site and we don't know anything about construction, yeah? Yet we see ourselves as really like the savior of the world, yeah, uh, trying to make the world a better place. Um, but why not? Okay. So against this sort of backdrop, yeah, um, my aim is not to discourage you, okay, uh, but conversely, it's actually to encourage you that look, um, if you try and like I said, I, I will share our stories on five different projects, yeah. Um, then perhaps uh, there are ways to sort of get around, you know, the challenges that we have or the sort of conflicting interests that we have. And uh, perhaps then, you know, be able to produce something uh, that is to be enjoyed by people and perhaps to sort of improve people's lives, yeah. Um, so as was mentioned, um, I, Prince, okay. Um, Siyash is a practice that uh, was founded in 1992, and we, we do a wide variety of work, yeah. Um, but uh, I would say most of our work, practically all our work is commercially driven, yeah, for developers, uh, for business owners, yeah. So we face all the sort of different pressures that are there to that, yeah. Added to that, of course, trying to keep a practice sort of running and profitable, okay? Um, but with that as a backdrop, okay, I'll take you through the five projects and just go through, you know, some of the things that we face and how we sort of got over them, okay? So project number one, and the mansions, okay? The mansions is, um, in this Park City, uh, if you don't know it, it's on a beautiful location. It's um, just about the highest point. It sits on a piece of rock, yeah? Uh, 
uh, elevated views, you can see KLCC from here, right? So, um, the, so it was sort of the client's, uh, you know, crown jewel of this apart for the landed properties side, yeah? And that rock that it sat on, um, basically, we immediately recognized that, wow, you know, um, where it is exposed to rock phase is very beautiful. And um, it was a chance to create a sort of unique address for the people there, yeah. And obviously, we are thinking, right, unique address, good for the client as well, good for marketing, right? Everything looks great, okay. However, it, as it turned out, the rock face was the problem, okay? And the problem was that uh, it wasn't that uh, the rock face would collapse, okay? But because it was fractured and weathered rock, okay? Uh, the engineers told us that there was a chance of small pebbles falling off from time to time, okay? Um, so the houses built on top were fine, okay? But we couldn't keep our rock face as as uh, our sort of defining feature. Yeah. So the engineer said, "No, fine, we can solve this problem." Yeah. Um, but you know, uh, this was their solution for it. Okay. Uh, basically, to short creek and gunite the entire slope. Okay. Um, obviously, that was not going to be the solution we accepted. So. We basically worked together okay, with the entire team. And um, we realized then that the solution was not to keep the pebbles from falling off, but uh, let the pebbles fall off, right? As it was. But the idea is just to keep it safe for people. Yeah. And so what we did was we sat down, we worked with the engineers, measured the heights, of this, of the various sections, and we calculated with them what was the trajectory of these pebbles falling off. Yeah, um, and this rock face was basically at the entrance to the building. Okay, uh, so what we calculated then a certain distance would be safe plus more. Yeah, and this was where the sort of entrance driveway came in. Okay, and what we did then was we just put a series of fair face concrete. Uh, garden walls. So we worked with the landscape architect as well. We, we got a sort of nice composition in garden going. Yeah. And uh, you see them there. Yeah. Over here. So these, these are not just walls, but they're doing the job of basically catching any loose material coming off this cliff. Yeah. And so, you know, today we, we, we have this as a sort of unique address. So the engineer is happy. The client is more than happy, and the residents enjoy this uh, every time they, you know, come back home. Yeah, so um, that's one piece. Then. Okay, okay. Um, let's get to the inside of the building. Yeah. So project number two. Uh, this is Iringan Hijau. It's a small low-rise uh, apartment. Okay, in Ampam area. And um, it basically sits on a sort of very strong uh, concrete base, fair face concrete base, as you see there, yeah. Uh, we had the chance to use good materials, good fittings. Uh, we had the chance to provide uh, even custom-made ironmongery, okay. Uh, custom-made uh, basins, uh, lovely interiors, and he has all the sort of usual facilities that you would expect from a, a development like this, okay? It sits on a very strange piece of land. So you can see it was originally two pieces of land, but joined here at the hip. Uh, yeah. So we very quickly, I mean, recognized that the way in to both sites was really through this axis here. Okay, and uh, we then grouped on three blocks, one, two, and three here. And they were always grouped around sort of nice gardens as you do, yeah. Clubhouse is here and pool is on the lower level there. So you come in here, you're driving along here 
And this part slowly ramps down into a courtyard on this side, yeah. And from the courtyard, what happens then is you're coming down the courtyard here and you drive into the sub-basement car park. And at the sub-basement car park, you will see this is where the entrances to the units are. So you come in here at sub-basement, over here all these units. You can come into the unit here and they have back gardens, private back gardens, okay? So circulation, nice gardens, all working uh, properly, nicely, okay? Uh, we then realized that what we have done is really design something where uh, it's a common problem for almost every multi-unit development in, in Malaysia. And that is, uh, you design nice gardens and courtyards and drop-offs there, which hardly anybody uses. If you're a resident, you're coming down, you're coming home through the basement car park. And the basement car park is usually a pretty neglected space, okay? Um, so what we did then, if you look at this long section, okay, we then started developing a sort of two-tier garden. Yeah, so if you look at this section, um, hang on, oops. Okay, hang on, it's gonna go back. If you look at this section, um, there are planters here on top, which are the sort of uh, gardens in between the blocks. And then there's a second tier of planting down here. So there are also planters down here at the sub-basement level where the trees grow up through, okay, yeah. Um, so here on this shot, you can see, so these, this patch of long green, our gardens, okay. This gray area with trees growing up are also planters, okay. So these are all suspended planters. But here, if you see here, uh, these are the sort of gray, gray things. They've got trees growing through from below, yeah. So we figured out that by doing this, uh, opening out the basement to uh, basically provide. Um, natural light and air, and in fact, letting the weather in, so the rain actually gets in here, okay? Uh, we, we can basically transform a uh, basically a dingy car park, you know, into something I think quite nice to come home to, yeah? So we've also taken care to basically, as you see, engineer all the sort of M and E out of the way. So we just have the bare concrete and bare concrete soffit, yeah? You park your car here and the entrances to your home and you go home out on your left and right through these doors, yeah, okay. Um, so at this point, I just wanna show you this diagram, okay? Um, in our practice, uh, we, we've sort of over the years developed this idea of something called design value. And I think we always tell ourselves and we also tell everyone that works with us, with the client, is that to us, uh, a design must carry value, yeah? And that hierarchy, um, well, not really hierarchy, but I suppose that the sort of uh, spheres of influence, yeah, are basically, um, shown in these four circles, these four opening circles. So we recognize that obviously it starts with the client, okay? Uh, without the client, there is no project. So we, we have to address that. How can our design give value to the client? Yeah, whether it's a nice space to live, whether it's a nice place to live that makes him money, yeah, whether it uh, functions well, okay? Or if the client doesn't own it, if it's a developer, then the user, the next tier, okay? And uh, very often then we work it so that it becomes a symbiotic relationship, yeah? So the user's got to be happy and what good does it do to the community where the sort of building sits, okay? Now, if 
by designing something that uh, works well with the community, uh, helps the client get their planning permission faster, okay? Then we are giving value to community as well as the client, okay? Uh, if, for instance, making spaces that are beautiful and desirable to users, okay, that also helps the developer client to sell his buildings, yeah? And if taking care of the environment uh, provides, you know, a better uh, sort of space to live in, again, it goes back to the client. So we're always looking at this diagram and saying, that, okay, how do we take care of all four, yeah, uh, all four basically uh, stakeholders in this, yeah? So uh, that's our idea of sort of design value, yeah? And, um, okay, we move on to, okay, another commercial project, a little bit more dense, yeah? So this is uh, the breezeway, also in this apart city. And you see that this, this is a site plan, right? It's basically a, a sort of hybrid residential sort of development. So you've got the low rise here, right? Three stories uh, set amongst sort of gardens, gardens here, completely traffic free. So all the traffic is basically relegated to the edges and to a car park block coming here, right? And you've got the tower block, which is the more urban face that faces uh, the commercial side here, okay? Now let's uh, concentrate on the tower for this one, okay? Now, so if you ever design a high-rise tower, yeah, um, this, these, this is the sort of usual issue that you face, okay? Uh, you have a tall tower here, right? And in Malaysia, well, in KL, we are required to provide tons of parking space, okay? And usually that's accommodated in the podium over here, yeah? And so as your tower comes down, you've got to basically transfer all the structure into a workable car parking grid, yeah? Okay, so nothing poetic about this. Uh, the trouble with transfer structures is it allows you to freedom to, to do what you do in the tower, okay? But they cost lots of money and they cost lots of time, both of which uh, clients obviously don't want to have to deal with, yeah? So in Breezeway, what we did was, uh, the piece of land was large enough. And what we did was this podium, we shifted out clear of the tower, very simple, yeah. Uh, basically, we asked ourselves, how do we avoid a transfer? Well, if you don't have a car park below it, you don't need a transfer, okay? So that's the first thing we did, we moved it down and uh, no transfer no extra money, no extra time. Um, and what we have was then a sort of five-story lobby, okay? Bear in mind, we have a lot of structure coming down, yeah, from there. Um, but, um, and that's a section of it. So you can see this is the car parking, this is the low-rise units. So we've shifted the car parking out from under here, out over to this side, yeah, okay. And so with a five-story, space, what we did down, what we did then was obviously, again, to work with our engineers to come up with structure that was beautiful, okay? Uh, we used fair face concrete, and you can see these are the shear walls coming straight down here, okay? Uh, intermediate columns uh, turned into fins, yeah? So that we can enclose some of the spaces there, okay? And then the tie beams, uh, usually narrow and skinny. Okay, so what we did was then we sort of turned the tie beams onto its side. And what we have then, uh, they became sun shades and obviously a composition for the facade, yeah. So what we ended up then was really a, uh, almost a sort of museum-like quality space, yeah, which became the lobby 
uh, entrance lobby to the uh, apartment. Okay. So another, another sort of uh, favorite term we like to use uh, in the office is to de-engineer the structures. Yeah. So, okay, engineering is required. We need to keep those buildings up. But uh, what can we do to make them beautiful? Yeah, and in this case, uh, bring the structure down, turn the beams on their side, um, and basically choose a material that, you know, um, is sort of good in itself, and that basically then you form the space, okay? Um, obviously through this, you see there are, we've got uh, fire escape stairs coming down, yeah, from the tower. Here, you see them here as well. And what we do again is that, um, okay, you can see that there. So we've got a tall space, okay. Um, uh, glimpses of the garden outside, yeah. And then we've got all this vertical circulation done, down, okay. Uh, so we have one more trick was really to take this. I mean, there wasn't budget anymore for a very fancy stair and all that, you know, we had spent it all on the, fair face concrete but what we did was we just took this simple concrete stair and we opened the dock lake and we took it for a walk yeah so the fire escape stair then became a uh, feature as it were yeah and actually this has encouraged people to use the stair when they're coming down from the podium because if it's a nice space uh, nice airy bright interesting space, why not use it, yeah. And you can see it's, it's just a very ordinary cement screen stair, yeah, uh, metal railings. Um, and this became known as the Harry Potter stair in the project, yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, something very different now, okay. So um, I'm gonna take you out of town. Um, this is basically North Para, Ulu Para, and you see Thailand here, okay? So I'm gonna take you through the Bulom Rainforest Resort, yeah. So I think as you can see, it's really in the middle of nowhere, okay? Um, it's about, Greek is the nearest town, so this is about 50 kilometers, yeah. And it's about 80, 90 kilometers to Jelly in Kelantan. Yeah. And you're about 50 kilometers to the Thai border. Okay. Uh, Balloon Rainforest Resort was basically set up as a sort of entry point into the Royal Balloon State Park and the Tamango Forest. Yeah. Uh, this um, is probably the most pristine forest reserve and uh, forest park that we have in Malaysia, yeah, in peninsular Malaysia. Uh, simply for the reason that uh, oh, in the earlier years, uh, during the time of the emergency, uh, this was a sort of communist health area. So Royal Balloon is pristine. There's no logging, there's no poaching. Oh, well, there is poaching. Uh, there's no logging, there's no development at all allowed. And till today, it's a security zone. Yeah, so if you have to go in, you have to get relevant permits from the police and the uh, army, okay. The Mongol Forest Reserve is a um, working forest, so there is some logging there, yeah. And we are sort of in the middle of this, where the East Coast Highway is, okay. Uh, if you haven't done this drive, I recommend it. It's uh, beautiful, yeah. We, if you go in early in the morning or late at night, you will see elephants on the highway, okay. So, okay, enough about the setting now. And uh, the Bulum Rainforest Resort is on Pulau Banding Island, uh, which uh, sits in the Tamongo Dam, okay? So Tamongo Dam was built in the 70s, yeah? And uh, essentially it was valleys that they flooded and this is really the peak. So we dealt with pretty steep uh, gradients that we have. This is the east-west highway that you see, yeah. Uh, we also built a research center, um, but we're gonna focus on this guy, yeah, for the rainforest. 
Now, uh, there were lots of ideas for this, okay? Uh, we built phase one of it. You will see phase two has this, and there were a lot of things to juggle, okay? Firstly, we were in the forest, so the place is teeming with uh, life, yeah, flora and fauna. Uh, that affected the way how we detailed stuff, okay? You will see this very strange line marking 254 meters, okay? Uh, that is actually the spillway height of the Tamango Dam, yeah? And essentially, uh, that is the maximum height that the water can rise up in the dam, in, in the reservoir, okay? So we, we have certain distances we need to keep from that. And uh, what you don't see, but actually you see from here, the east-west highway snaking along, yeah? Oops. We have the east-west highway on this side, yeah? Okay, so our, our, our strip of land was here. We basically had a long strip of land facing the water on this side, okay? And our challenge was to turn this guy, which was an old rest house, uh, designed and built uh, in uh, six months, yeah? Uh, basically to occupancy. Well, the original pro program was four months, uh, but the client was generous. He gave us two extra months. Yeah. So it, it was fun while it lasted, uh, not to be repeated again. And uh, the, the sort of key phrase was Uruhara. Yeah. Um, Uruhara just means basically chaos, confusion. Yeah. Uh, so basically, to turn this, uh, into this in a very short space of time in somewhere that is in the middle of nowhere, okay? Now, um, we, we searched for uh, an appropriate expression to the buildings, yeah? Uh, being next to the jungle, okay? But bear in mind, we, we needed speed. Yeah, so it couldn't be anything too complicated and it couldn't be anything that took too long to procure material wise. Yeah. So essentially, uh, it, it eventually what you see, uh, this is a block of rooms, yeah, yeah, is that they're actually very simple buildings. Uh, they have a steel frame, so that went up very quickly uh, with block wood walls, yeah. And then we put on a safari roof. So basically a double skin roof with a 450 mm air gap in the middle, okay? So the air gap served as uh, insulation, but uh, it was chosen, it deals with the rain noise. And also it, deal, it also provided extra protection because some blocks have a lot of trees around it. Uh, so were branches to fall and all that and to break a roof, you would have a second roof to protect you. Yeah. Um, we also needed uh, basically materials that would age well so close to the forest. Yeah. So as you know, if you stick something in a forest very soon, moss, lichen, all sorts of stuff will just grow on it. Yeah. So we, we limited the area of um, plain walls, plain plastered walls, yeah? And the decision then was taken to basically clad the facades with uh, these saplings, yeah? So they, they are from a local species uh, called Soma wood, yeah? Which grow straight and tall, they grow fast. So it's very sustainable to harvest them. Uh, and they were then placed basically in this very simple galvanized frame. You see that, okay? So we also wanted something that was easily replaced if you needed to. And if you look at this image, this part of the image here, essentially the frame is basically two frames with two holes. You stick it in and you just put a wedge of timber in there. So no fixings, no screws, nothing like that. Very simple, yeah? Um, and this basically gave the buildings its character, okay? So we also applied this to, um, you know, 
well, all over it really. So at night, it makes the building uh, a lantern. Yeah. Uh, it helps also cuts out the glare at night because we were very um, aware uh, and looking out to minimize the sort of light pollution. Yeah. Uh, it's used to cover the MNE. So these are the sort of screens for the air conditioning. Yeah. And we use it on the interior as well for railings and all that. Okay. And of course, it's great at picking up lighting and giving it some atmospherics. Yeah. Um, at the back of the garden, uh, we have a basically whole line of trees and gardens. Yeah. And also lots of water features. Okay. Um, now, this water feature uh, serves two purposes. Yeah. One, it's uh, really obviously to make it look pretty. When you have trees and you have, you have water, you also start to attract uh, fauna, birds, yeah, uh, frogs, and things like that. So we wanted nature to come up close to the resort. Yeah. Uh, but secondly, it's also there to generate white noise. Because uh, remember, behind this wall, where the water spouts are coming up, is the east-west highway. So although not so busy, it can get quite noisy at night when the trucks are pulling along. So uh, very often what we do is we tell the clients, it's uh, two for the price of one. Yeah? I'm solving your problem, which is the traffic noise by putting white noise. And with that, um, you, you give me a nice water feature and everything will be all right. Yeah. So um, with that, Okay, so finally we managed to deliver this building, yeah. And this 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 brick wall now has become a bit of a statement or a bit of an Instagram moment for people who uh, visit that, yeah. And so how how did that come about? Yeah, how how did we come up with this uh, texture or this design? Uh, very simple. It was again to solve another problem because it was so far from. Uh, well, any town, uh, the nearest dump site was about 70 kilometers away. So we used all the brick from the demolition of the existing buildings uh, to put this out, yeah. Um, I mean, it wasn't designed. And what we designed was basically two rows of bricks. And then we just sort of worked it out with the workers and, you know, so, uh, this also became to sort of, uh, in a way, reminds us of the project. You know, so we we call it our uh, our Huruhara wall. Yeah, uh, a bit of like the chaos when we went through the project. Okay. Okay. Finally, um, something um, very different, very urban. Okay, in KL in Monkara. Okay, so this is twine. We just completed it last year. And this is a 51 story service apartment um, on quite a small piece of land. Yeah, so if you look at this image, you can see your tower. And this is sort of the classic sort of tower arrangement that we have that I spoke about earlier. Tower comes down, you've got a podium, right? There is a transfer happening somewhere there. And the rest of it is seven floors of parking plus more parking to meet our parking requirements for DBKL. Okay. So there's not a lot you can do with the stack. Yeah. Um, you will see that on the ground floor, on the ground level, uh, there is just enough space to get your circulation round and also to get your fire access uh, rounded, okay? So really your, your common areas are, you know, um, left with the podium and the roof, yeah? So, so we put in nice gardens and nice rooms for people to enjoy in the roof, yeah? Uh, we gave them a nice lobby. Um, I think the space would be a little bit more poetic 
if all this was fair face concrete uh, rather than plaster, but it's not, it's what it is. Um, but, you know, uh, the thing that clients will say to you is, I need 80% efficiency for this thing to work, okay? And again, if, if any of you guys have done towers and done this calculation, I think you will know that, you know, if you're not careful, this will give you 80%, okay? You basically stack the units on both sides, lift lobby on one side, and you've got to keep this quite narrow and straight and long, okay? Three escape stairs there, you know? So this is what we did not want, okay? So on Toy, what we did was we took this plan and we opened it up, okay? Into basically like an X, yeah? And um, of course, then that opened up all the walkways, you know? And suddenly your walkways had views. Uh, you felt the breeze as you were walking through and you get lots of natural light, okay? Uh, a central uh, lift lobby, okay? Branching out into four neighborhoods as it were, okay? So, but then you may say, well, how, how did we get 82%, okay? Uh, we've got double the amount of walkway, okay? So the, the, the trick is really, uh, number one, we've put more units on each floor. So they're actually 24 units per floor. That's a lot, yeah? Uh, but by dividing them and splitting them into four different neighborhoods, actually, if you are living here, you're basically living with five other neighbors, yeah? Uh, so that made it bearable, but still, how do you get that 82%, okay? The trick is that um, Toy is, is um, basically composed of completely all duplex units. So we've got, you know, 400 plus duplex units. And with the sort of double units, what we have is half the amount of corridors. Hence, you know, we, we can have these single loaded circulation areas, yeah, uh, and achieve the efficiency that we want. Okay. Um, another idea was then that um, something that was lacking in apartment living is that you, you go in, uh, you go up, down your corridor and into your room and that's it, because you're, you're usually faced with a blank wall. Now, with a single loaded corridor, okay, uh, we are allowed to have windows on this side, okay? So what we've done is replace all the kitchens there. And the idea then is that as you're going home to your apartment, you pass through a few, hopefully you see some neighbors uh, cooking. Um, and we, we hope that, you know, uh, it, it will basically enable sort of a community spirit to take root, yeah. Okay. Um, what else can we do to uh, make something better for apartments? Okay. We also wanted uh, a lot more life in the common areas. Yeah. Now, I think you saw in the slide earlier on, uh, there's not, no space on the ground to plant anything. Yeah. So, uh, what we wanted was. We already have a roof garden, but so what we wanted here on the podium roof was to make the podium roof an entire waterscape, yeah. Uh, why is that? Because um, we find that uh, gardens in apartments, quite often they become quite sterile places, yeah. They are manicured, nice looking gardens, but don't really do a lot, yeah. So we found that if we can uh, create a waterscape, okay, it makes something feel a little bit more alive, okay? So we worked with our landscape architect and we came up with this, which is this water garden that is almost an acre in area, yeah? And it's basically 
a biopond. So it has its own ecosystem. Uh, there are fish and frogs and tadpoles in the water. Okay, the fish basically shit in the water. Uh, they are shit basically feeds the plants. The plants attracts insects and birds. Uh, the fish eats the insects. Yeah, and the whole thing goes on. And the plants also filter the water and keep the water clean. Yeah. So by doing this, we 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 managed to sort of introduce more sort of flora and fauna into otherwise quite a sterile space. Okay. Now uh, all this costs money. So how did we convince the client to let us do this? Yeah. Um, again, um, we resorted to selling two for the price of one. Yeah. So um, it comes back to engineering. No one questions the engineer. If you need structure, uh, it's going to be there. Okay. Um, so for all buildings in KL, or in, in Klang Valley, probably. Okay, there is a requirement, engineering requirement for stormwater detention tanks. Yeah. And a typical tank would be basically a concrete tank buried underground in under the lowest level. Okay. So we worked with our engineers and of course with our landscape architect. And uh, we took quite some time to convince the authorities that uh, instead of storing our stormwater here before releasing it into the drain, why not store it on our water garden, on our biopond up there, okay? And given the area of the pond, uh, the differential, I think we only needed to store about two inches of rainwater, yeah? So it, it had minimal impact on uh, any extra structure that we needed to do. Yeah. And so with this, obviously, uh, it started to make financial sense. Um, it gave the clients uh, a nice feature to market. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, today the residents uh, get to enjoy this. Yeah. Um, we've got facilities and gyms sort of hanging over the water, yeah, as it were. Okay. Right. Um, so in, in conclusion, yeah, um, I think this quote from Le Corbusier sums it up quite nicely. Yeah. So he talks about using stone, wood, and concrete and building houses and palaces. Okay. And that's construction. Okay. But if you manage to touch people's hearts and you do them good and make them happy, then he says that is beautiful, right? And that is architecture with a big A, okay? Um, and art enters in, yeah. So um, I'm not saying that uh, what I've shown you uh, basically meets all this criteria, uh, but like I say, what I want to do was just share with you uh, some of the things we aspired to, some of the battles we fought and how we sort of got our own way and, you know, uh, I believe made some nice spaces, yeah. And at the end of the day, uh, as I said, poetics is really uh, quite subjective. It's about responses, yeah. Um, and you can see from the sort of little survey at the beginning, uh, your responses are quite varied. But I think there are certain universals that we all appreciate as human beings, right? Uh, natural light, shadow, uh, comfortable space, you know, a, a breeze on your skin, uh, you know, a texture of walls and, and uh, floor. Basically anything that sort of engages your, your senses. Yeah, and perhaps when we manage to achieve, you know, some of this, your response, your personal response based on your own memories and experiences, then, you know, something so poetic uh, arises. Sometimes it's a sort of happy accident. Yeah, so this is a house we are still constructing in Ladang. Uh, and when the sun came up and we were watching the shadows, suddenly, you know, 
uh, we just saw this heart shape and, and we said, wow, okay. <laughs> I didn't know we designed that. Yeah. Uh, so I'll end here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Architect Wilson. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you very much, Architect Wilson, for a very inspiring, uh, insightful lecture on poetics and practice. Okay, so probably we can open the floor to our students uh, and our, my colleagues if you have any questions. Okay, probably we'd like to start with Architect Wicket. Wicket, do you have any question for your good friend, Architect Wilson? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, I, 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 um, I always found that the work is poetic, so that's why I'm, well, first of all, I joined them, and second thing is, um, yes, that's why I asked Wilson to uh, come along um, to show. Um, now, what, uh, perhaps my questions, I, I lost track, I write it somewhere. Um, I'll let someone else first, I'll, I'll come back uh, on this, okay? Okay. Is it a very long, lengthy question? We get no, no, no. It's, it's, I, I think uh, yeah. I'll come back to this. Uh, students. Okay, okay. No, no problem. He knows all our tricks anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, probably we can. Anyone from our uh, very creative students? Um, anyone from the group? You also may type in your question in the chat box if you're shy to to ask the question personally. Okay. Uh, or probably while waiting for them, uh, I can see uh, our poetic group, Miss Tay, uh, Miss uh, Eric. Uh, if you I have, have any questions. questions. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I my personal favorite is uh, Breezeway. The day it won a Pam Design Award. Oh, okay. Okay. Congratulations. That was many years ago. Yeah. Thank About you. Two yeah. zero two zero one four. Um, I can't remember. And um, the most striking element, of course, is the fire staircase. Um, right. I have been encouraging my students because of that project to look at fire staircase in a different light. Mm. Like because Breezeway can do it and yes. it passed as a bomber escape. Yes. Am I right to say that? Correct. It is. Yeah. Correct. yeah. So I would like now to re- how should I say, to reinforce myself again to my students, those who are listening, fire staircases can be poetic. Fire staircases can be very interesting. And I told them why fire staircases, people cannot be bothered because it is something that is so utilitarian, something that's very hard to convince our client to spend mm. money on. So yeah. I'm wondering, what do you have to go through to convince the client to do that beautiful poetic Fire staircase? Uh, well, actually, not a lot. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. The fire staircase was required anyway. It was one of the three in the tower. Okay. Um, and I think if you look at the image, um, it's basically, you know, it has no finishes, um, mild steel. And I, I think the client did have a vision. Yeah, of, of uh, uh, um, I think they, they understood what we were trying to do with that tall lobby. Yeah, having allowed us to do the tall lobby, but only because we, we told them that, look, you're saving all this money on transfer. Yeah, and uh, basically taking that, and I think we just calculated, look, you know, if you let me take the central fire staircase for a walk, as it were, you know, it's an extra, 10% of length and it's so much, yeah. So quite often we do these calculations. We, we sort of work out that uh, with the help of our, our consultant QS obviously, and just say, look, you know, your, your project is so many million and can I spend, you know, 80,000 more on a staircase or 50,000? I can't remember how much, it wasn't a lot. So it really came down to the numbers, yeah. And uh, yeah, luckily they, they were very pleased with the result. Uh, yeah, uh, but it proves that you, you don't need anything very expensive. I think probably in the earlier version, we had some fancy feature steel stair, but you know, that got thrown out the window much earlier. <laughs> yeah, that's usually the, the case, yeah. All right, thank you. Okay. You like also lucky with your creativity and you have the right client. Uh, 
yes. timeless vision. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think, you know, yeah. we try and learn to speak their language and in, in our commercial world is obviously money. So you, you've got to sort of <laughs> yeah. in and then try and slip in what, you know, you think is good for the, for the building. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. So much, uh, Ben, and good architect Wilson, um, is uh, our, our resident poetic architect, <laughs> Liu. <laughs> Mr. Liu, do you have any question? Uh, we call Mr. Liu the Liu Khan. <laughs> Ah. <laughs> of, thank, you, uh, thank you, Prince. Uh, okay. so, so now, I was just thinking uh, about your practice. Uh, it's quite difficult because uh, you are very much a commercial architect. And um, to value engineer your work, you know, to put some priority in politics is not easy. So you, you try as an artist your best to have your... Uh, politics in some areas, you know, so it can express itself. Otherwise, like what you say in the last slide, uh, it won't be art, it won't be art, you know, it will just be another building, you know. So it's very difficult to balance. I just a statement I make, just a statement, an observation. Right. It's hard to balance between commercial and politics. Yeah. yeah. If we get it wrong, <laughs> it could be more commercial than politics. Yes. Yeah. 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 Get it right. And it's all boiled down to engineering, value engineering. That's the difficult part. Yeah. Do you can you share? Do you get to share, Wilson? Yeah, I mean, we we again have this thing saying that, oh, you know, the client wants to value engineer. And the joke is that, oh, this is where they engineer all the value out of our design. You know? <laughs> 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 so I, I think that the, the thing what we do is, uh, I suppose, I mean, it goes back to that diagram of client, user, community, and environment, right? And as we think along that, we, we make sure we take care of number one, which is a client, um, and sort of speak his language. So um, then once you've sort of got that settled, we also recognize that, you know, uh, you have to take care of the engineering very, very early. Yeah, so I think we're, we're pretty rigorous about that in the office. We go through that, everything is sorted out. We don't leave that to chance because, again, you don't want to create something that is beautiful and poetic. And then on site, the M&E contractor says, oh, by the way, I've got this thing, this pipe <laughs> running through. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not saying we get it perfect all the time. You know, there, there have been uh, all sorts of episodes. Um, but yeah, I, I guess the thing is to, to keep trying, uh, yeah, I mean, just I focus, uh, you know, uh, how do you say? Uh, you can't win all your battles, but you choose, uh, you choose which yeah. one you, you think you want to do and, and uh, make, sure, make sure everyone is satisfied. Make sure the client fulfills, you know, what he, whatever he needs. And usually it's numbers. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing. It's a difficult job, I know. Isn't it? It is. It's a balancing act. Yeah, it's a yeah. balancing act. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Prince. Okay, thanks, Lee. Uh, thanks, Wilson. Um, Wicked, uh, are you ready to ask a question? Well, um, <laughs> in fact, yes, I just got one pulled out from my pocket. Um, no, I thought the <laughs> students are going to do it. But um, um, just two, two things. Uh, um, I think first thing is um, um, we are trying to teach so-called poetics architecture. So I did this because you have a capital architecture also, so yeah. poetics architecture. Yeah. Um, now, first thing is poetics. Uh, as we try to look out, right, even if you Google poetics architecture, billions of things comes out. And mm. uh, the poetics architecture range from country born or, you know, there, there's so many different things. So like even just now we did the research uh, or, or you did a quick, Few tests, huh? What yeah. is poetic and what is not poetic? Um, is that subjective, or how do we, what 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 do we define like poetics for some may not be poetics for someone else? So you got a you know big uh, rich guy that say, oh no, this is lovely, this is poetics, but for you like so cultures background. So in that case, how do you play in terms of poetics? Now that's one. And second question would be, then 
what do you think us as an educator or perhaps as a practitioner cultivates uh, poetics, uh, this sense of poeticness in um, like even students or if not as a practitioner? Okay. I hope that's not too heavy. Thank you. Uh, that's a very long two questions, but um, <laughs> first one, poetics. Um, um, I think as I mentioned earlier, uh, to me, poetics is a little bit subjective, okay? Uh, because it, uh, I believe it involves uh, the people's response to it, the user's response, yeah? Uh, so how do you feel when you enter these sort of things, these sort of spaces, or what memory does it, you know, uh, evoke? Or, you know, what does it remind you of, yeah? Um, uh, um, so, but quite often you will see that uh, such spaces are usually not very ornate. They're actually quite plain, okay? Uh, if, if you were to distill it. A very good example would be Lieberskin's uh, Jewish Museum, yeah? And, you know, you go into space, the spaces are very plain, but, you know, uh, it's things like when you walk, what the sort of sound does it make, yeah? What's the lighting like? So I think to me, key to it is actually how you engage all your senses, yeah? Uh, I think if you go into a place where it is thematic, okay, the environment is well controlled, it's comfortable, brightly lit, everything is just right, uh, but there isn't that, that, that something special uh, that tickles you, then, you know, Quite likely, you're going to say that's very dull. Now, there may be somebody who says, no, this is the way I like it. Uh, fine, you know, I, I think he's, he or she is allowed to like it. Uh, but I think if you call it poetic, I think most, well, most design students would say, mm, no, I don't think so. You know, it's not, it's not that special. Yeah. Um, does that make sense? I'm, I'm just trying, it's, it's quite a general answer but I'm trying to sort of distill it. But like I said, there's no sort of fixed formula or there's, there's no sort of checklist, you know? They do these 10 things and you get a poetic space, yeah? Mm. Uh, like I say, sometimes you set something up like the last slide and sometimes it's a happy accident. Uh, wow, you know, and then, okay, next thing you know, it's your Christmas card, right? <laughs> um, okay, second question, uh, as educators, right? How, how, how how do we or, or how do we uh, address this or encourage this? Okay. Um, I think if, if you look at the thread of the argument of what we've been discussing this afternoon, yeah, it really starts with spaces. Yeah. Um, and I know I showed some stuff that is external but it really starts with spaces uh, designing inside out. Um, we do, I think, you know, we, we, are, we are not the modern movement now, or we're not, we're not, at the moment, I think where we are, it's sort of a hybrid. Uh, but, you know, when we plan out, uh, when we draw that plan, you know, uh, in those sort of abstract motions, uh, these lines that I don't know, you know, line up with certain axes and all that. I'm not saying that's wrong. Uh, that can be a very useful way of organizing your plan. But I think one has to always take a step back and say, okay, what, what is that doing to the space? What's that doing? So in a way, you've got to design it inside out sometimes. Yeah. And you start sketching the space and then you go back to the plan. I think what what I tend to do is I sort of flip from plan to sketch the plan to sketch our space. Yeah. And uh, yes, you know, I, I like all my lines to line up and all my walls to line up and all that, <laughs> like, like every architect. Uh, but, you know, that has to inform the space. Uh, if it doesn't, then, you know, chuck it out. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Um. Yeah. I'm. I'm also. Yeah. The subjective of the P with a capital, right? Poetics and yeah. 
So yes, because sometimes, you know, when you got client that says, hey, no, nah, I, I, they can't see it, then although everyone or the academics or perhaps the practitioners, your peers mm-hmm. say that, oh, that's beautiful, you know, the, the, the likes, oh, everything is very poetic. Yeah. Um, but um, if, you know, uh, some people that don't get it, then, um, yeah, is, is that a process or should they, yeah, do no. something to, so that they can get it? Um, maybe it's just the person then, I guess. I think, well, how do you say? Hmm. I think one thing, one skill that is slowly fading away, you know, at the risk of sounding like an old man, <laughs> is, is sketching. Sketch. Yeah. Uh, because uh, no matter how fast you can model and how accurate it is, uh, when you are thinking of the space, uh, there's, there's nothing quicker and more effective than a quick sketch to test it out, you know? And with the sketch, you can do anything. You can put people in, you can put sunlight in, you can put textures. Uh, I don't have to model this and pick a view. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a very sort of handy tool for, for students to have. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know whether it's a prerequisite now, but I think there are. I mean, you know, I see in the work that people do sketch, but do they do it as a design process and do they, you know, use it? as a design tool, it's a, it's a language. I think that's the most, that's the quickest way between brain and paper and what you see. And to say, okay, I've got this space. No, it's not quite there, you know. I want it deeper, I want it darker. I want it, you know. You can't do that in the model in a split second, but you can do it with a sketch, yeah. Um, okay, there are a couple of questions on the, on the chat. Yeah, shall I go through them? Yeah. Yeah, again, again. yeah. Okay. So, any issues while getting approval from the authority while submitting the BP for breezeway fire staircase? Uh, in a word, no. Okay. Um, we knew that 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 void below was a naturally ventilated space. Yeah. So, uh, if you follow the UBBL, that is allowed. Okay. Um, secondly, obviously. Uh, once we got the idea and we got the sketch, we went to see uh, the building officers yeah, and the fire officer uh, to make sure that was right. So that's the part that you have to do your homework. Yeah? The worst thing you can do is propose something to a client and later on come back to him and say, well, actually Bomba won't allow me to do that. You, know? uh, you, 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 you won't earn their trust that way. Yeah? So no, that wasn't a problem. Okay. Um, okay. Um, second question. Yeah. Um, how much of the users play a role in places of community, such as a residential, in creating a beautiful and stimulating environment? Do you see an evolution in the level of participation and personalization in these places in the near future? Okay. Um, in the work that you've seen, uh, they are commercial projects. So they are built and then sold off the shelf by the developer, yeah? So in those cases, unfortunately, no. The, the user or the, the, the eventual resident really doesn't have much say in, in what we design for them, okay? Um, so, you know, all, all the more, I think, then we have a much greater responsibility to understand what people want and, and to, you know, give them something, sometimes uh, something that they can enjoy that maybe they don't even know they want, okay? Uh, we do have cases of projects where, you know, uh, things that we provided for, uh, uh, you know, uh, are not, you know, or the opposite of what people want, or they can't sort of see what we're getting at. So that is a problem. Do we see an evolution in the level of participation? I think that depends on how buildings are procured. Yeah. Uh, if it's the sort of developer, architect, developer, buyer model, then I don't think much is going to change, unfortunately. Yeah. I think it is a good thing. 
it's probably not for every project, I feel, yeah. Uh, we have worked with developers where we've explored uh, customizing uh, apartments, uh, not just in finishes and layout, but even in sizes and all that, okay? Uh, when you go into that territory, then, you know, uh, the authorities come into play, you know, how much uh, flexibility are you given in your submissions and all that. So that's difficult. I think um, one idea is if uh, there are smaller developments, uh, let's say like co-housing where, you know, 10, 12, uh, 15 individuals or family come together and say, okay, I want to, we want to build something to live together. Okay, then that would have the opportunity, yeah. But currently, I think in Malaysia, it's it's a difficult one, you know, at the moment. Yeah, things have to change. Um, okay, let's see. How would you, okay, question, huh? how would you describe tectonics as the foundation of poetics? Or would you say that they are separate entities? Oh, okay. Um, They are different things. They are separate things. Uh, although I think as an architect, um, when you conceive a space uh, or a setting, yeah, uh, the structure always comes in. Yeah. So I think you can see in, 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 in the work that we do, uh, very often uh, we, we make use of what we need to have anyway, the engineering, yeah. Uh, to, but we de-engineer them, yeah. So for instance, in Breezeway, where you see all the sort of concrete fin walls coming down, okay. Um, whether that's the most efficient way to hold up the building, I'm not sure, yeah. Uh, certainly to bring down the shear walls, yes, okay. But all the intermediate columns and the tie beams, uh, usually they're sort of skinny sort of pencil sticks, yeah. Uh, we wanted that to change. So we, you know, we recognize what tectonics need to do. Uh, I think in architecture, they are inseparable, although tectonics and, um, you know, poetics, are, I think two different parts, uh, maybe siblings, yeah, in architecture. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, may I ask regarding the mirror material used in the breezeway project, whether it requires high maintenance and what was the reason behind the material usage? Yeah, I think you ref in the breezeway project for people who don't know it, uh, on the entrance canopy, there is a sort of mirror soffit and also on the walkways through the gardens, there is also a mirror soffit, okay? That is actually mirror polish stainless steel. Yeah. Um, does it have a lot of maintenance? Well, just cleaning, and I think you have to polish it maybe twice a year or something like that. Yeah. So there is some maintenance, um, but I think it's sort of manageable. Okay. Reason behind using it? Um, I think for the lobby, we wanted the entrance to be lively. Yeah. So by putting a mirror, obviously you 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 see you reflect a lot of movement that's going on below, yeah. And in the walkways through the gardens, uh, we also wanted something light. So obviously a mirror, yeah, will sort of make it, you know, feel a lot lighter, yeah. And again, uh, something that will not, well, something that will age well, yeah. Let's say if properly maintained. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, for always some from our uh, lecturers and the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But thank you for uh, the questions, Yi, Shen, Bunhan, and Victor. Okay, thanks for joining us for today. Awesome. Anyone? Manin, do you have any question for Architect Wilson? Yeah, I guess maybe I just want to add, I think about eight or nine years ago, uh, mm. A group of Taylor students, I mean, one of our sessions, one of our groups actually went to Belum 
Oh. So we were actually, we were actually we, we actually had a site visit I think for what two or three days and we actually stayed at your place. All right. And um, it was quite it was quite a experience. Uh, um, especially being that they they went there they went there ahead of time. I mean they went there in the bus. I I came and joined them from Penang. Right. And I drove that road eight at yes. night. Oh, it was okay. Pitch pitch dark. Yes. Um, yeah. scary like shit um i was alone in the car and they're like no that you can't see anything in front of you and you look in the mirror you can't see anything behind you yeah it was just dark and uh, it was quite an amazing driver That's, but um yeah you're, you're right that road is uh it's quite a driver it's a very nice drive to drive in the day yeah. or night did you um, see elephants no i was worried i was in the middle of the night there were no receptions in the phone no reception there were no right. just nothing <laughs> if if anything happened um literally i'll be stuck in the middle of the darkness with elephants uh, so i wouldn't want to see elephants that time uh. right. uh, i wouldn't want to see anything else as well uh. so <laughs> <laughs> but it was a uh, but it was quite a uh, amazing place uh, since um, i think a few of us uh, i don't know whether and i don't think any of these tutors here was with me then i think at what was with I think Edward was in the group, I'm not sure. There's a, there was a group of us. Eric was there, right? Yeah, yeah. I was. Yeah, Eric was there. So I think about a few of us, I think about six or seven of us. Oh, okay. Um, we, stayed, we stayed there and it was quite a, quite a nice place to stay. You, guys, you didn't do the phase two, right? We what, didn't what did do the phase two. The, the one with the square cube. No, we um, didn't do it. We didn't. Yeah. That, yeah that's another was, story which I won't go into. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay, that's fine. I think, I think what, what um, a lot of, I mean, a lot of students may not realize that you made, um, I mean, a lot of your solutions that you presented just now, you made it effortless or you made it seem effortless. I mean, the, the fire escape down uh, breezeway, even uh, the, the whole idea of doing a single loaded corridor and then bringing the efficiency up to 82. Yeah. Um, it sounds so effortless, but mm -hmm. um, I know the problem because yeah. um, we, we try to squeeze in that mezzanine floor into the into a, an apartment as well and the, the bomber access and fire escapes and distance for the mezzanine floor to the running distance it's yes. it's, it's hell yeah um, but yeah. of course you, you you didn't point it out you didn't have to show it out because the thing is that you just basically solved it yeah. so i think the the point with i'm trying to say is that a lot of a lot of um, maybe for the students here is that you can do things but i think for you to do anything you want to do you really have to understand um your your, your parameters, what you can do and what you cannot do. Right. And you really have to understand the bylaws, you really have to understand. So once you know that limit and the parameters that you, you're given, then you're able to design to it. So you can design the fire escapes however you want it, but as long as you understand that, okay, it has to be this, 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 or it has to be within these parameters. So I think, I think what you don't show is the difficulty to achieve it. Because you make it so effortless. Uh. It says, uh, okay, it's uh, so easy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, glad you understand. Uh, I should have told more stories. But uh, yeah, but in a, in a way, that, that was the sort of, uh, how do you say, what I wanted to put across. It's that uh, it can be done. But yeah, you, you need, as you say, you know, you, you summarized it well. Um, you, you need to know your stuff. You need to, to know your parameters. And then you've got to work very hard to yep. deal with it. And that's convincing the client, convincing the engineers, the authorities, you know, the whole gang, really. Yeah. And the, funny, the funny thing is that we also have clients coming to us, hey, how come these guys can do it? How come we cannot do it? So in the sense that we also have to start to educate the client yes. how this is done yes. and why this is possible and why this is not possible. You know, they, 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 some project managers or even some clients say, hey, you can do this by doubling it up and you just do a mezzanine floor, you double your, uh, your efficiency by this, this, this. Yeah. yeah, but the thing is they don't know the parameters. So All right. there's a lot of education that needs to go into it and you tell them, or oh, you have to do it like this, yeah. this, this, this is what you can do. Yeah. So that's why I say it's, it's, it's quite effortless once it's done. It looks effortless, but the amount of work that needs to get there is it's quite serious. Yeah. Quite yeah. So I think that's what the students need to understand. Yes, I, I think, as you say, you know, uh, if it was a slightly different brief, then certain things couldn't have happened. And you mentioned the duplex. We could do it because the units were small. Mm -hmm. As you know, if the units were bigger, we need we would need another escape on the upper floor. And then yes. you, you can forget about the 82%, you know? Yeah, so it's, it's things like that, a combination of what the brief is, what, I suppose, how much, you know, 
faith the client has in you up to a point. Uh, you know, but at the end of the day, you got to show him the figures, and and uh, you know, you got to convince the whole team. Really, yeah, yeah. But you like you said that, like I said, you you need to know your stuff. Uh. You really need to know the parameters. Yes. And if you just go straight to a client yeah. and say, "I want to do this, do this, do this," without understanding the situation, you yeah. you're just gonna get kicked up and and just say, "Go back and think properly first." Yeah, <laughs> I think the key thing is to, uh, I suppose, don't don't. Don't say, well, this is the only way because everyone's done it this way. You know, mm -hmm. some of the solutions have come from saying, well, why does everyone do it this way? You know, why don't we try something else? And then, mm -hmm. you know, then it comes out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, it wasn't much of a question, but it's just a statement. That's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, probably it strengthened the quote that an architect says it can't be done will always find some interrupted by someone doing it. So this is, uh, I think, a perfect example of the architect. Can I, can I just add something? On top uh, of bang and Eric, yeah. Bang. yeah. I, I think uh, it's a lot, to, uh, money, a lot easier for students because their projects are not built. Sim. Okay. Yeah. So it remains as concept. So yeah. I think it's a lot easier for them to um, have a new concept and creative minds and creative ideas because they are not going to be built. It only gets really difficult when it has to be realized. You go through the authority approval, go through costing and go through engineering and mm -hmm. eventually construction and yeah. you know, all that. Yeah, I think so as students, um, don't be discouraged. I mean, Mr. Manin got a point. Real project is very hard, but as student, you have all the freedom to fly you know, and be creative. And I think Wilson's uh, projects are really amazing examples of what can be done, you know, even in real life, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think to add to that, um, I think it's important to have a big idea for each project. I mean, it applies to students, but in practice as well, if you have the big idea, then you know what you're fighting for, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and as you say, you know, as I said, some we concede, okay, we won't do this, okay, we won't do that, cost too much, you know. But we, if we are clear on the big idea, okay, you know, we hang on to certain things and we fight for that. Yeah. So we always say that as well. Something again in the office we say, we come to a scheme, okay, what's the big idea on this? You know, and then we check it a few months later, okay, is it still there? Or, oh no, no, what have we done to it? You know, have you got this lump because you're solving an engineering problem? Okay, let's get rid of it. How can we get rid of it? Yeah. So the big idea has been there, but that starts with school. Yeah. In, in school, you always have a sort of big, strong idea to any scheme. Yeah. Thanks, Wilson. Yeah. Eric, uh, probably we'll give you the final, final question because it's almost 4 p.m. Yeah. Eric. Thanks, Wilson, for a stimulating uh, talk. I enjoyed that very much. I, I've got uh, two questions. Uh, would you say money is in the way to create truly meaningful and poetic architecture? And the second question is, um, if you were to have an ideal client, what would, how would you describe him or her? Oh. <laughs> Okay, I think the first one, the first one is easier to answer. Uh, money is not in the way, I think. Um, I mean, um, from the range of projects I've shown, um, you know, there, it, there's a whole range, some that are got bigger budgets and some that have got very tight budgets, okay? Uh, but be that as it may, I think when when you're trying to sort of push the envelope, the, the, the budget is never enough anyway. So money is always going to be tight. I think, you know, what we have done is uh, decide uh, very clearly, um, you know, what, what like, as I say, what, what are the important things to the project? Uh, secondly, make sure that the engineering is either efficient as yes. much as it is, or if it's not, uh, it's serving your purpose, 
by creating nice spaces. Yeah, as we say, de engineer it. Yeah. And thirdly, I think uh, recognize uh, and always uh, be on top of the money part with reference to your client. Yeah. So the client doesn't think that you are this guy just spending his money, but that you are spending it wisely for him so that he can derive whatever benefit he wants. Yeah. If he's a developer to make money, if it's a business owner for his own use, he gets the most efficient space. Plus it's very beautiful for him. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I think money is not the problem. It's just part of the equation. Um, Ideal client. I think the ideal client is, well, I think someone that uh, you can have a conversation with, yeah, um, on all topics, not not, not just uh, narrow within the sort of premise of the project, but I think you know, sort of across the board on the sort of background of the project. I mean, we, we are fortunate, some of the clients, we have had one client who was a very talented individual. Uh, he, he was a jurisprudence uh, law professor. He was also a stockbroker and a musician. Yeah, and um, so as a result, I think, you know, as architects, our references are very wide and very varied, yeah. Uh, to be able to have conversations that will start from, okay, what do we want to make? Uh, how, how should, you know, the, the units be in this apartment? Okay, how much time do you spend in the living room? How big or small should the bedrooms be? How nice a place do we need to make a swimming pool? Or no, in this case, everyone's going to go out to the club. You know, so things like that are very sort of general rather than everything is okay about efficiency and all that. Then, you know, if there's that intellectual discourse, then you work together rather than uh, it's not so much a sort of patient doctor relationship. Yeah. Uh, but more as colleagues where you're, you're trying to sort of crack this thing together. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, not many around, but uh, there are, there are. We've been fortunate to have a few, <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Vincent. Wilson. Okay. Welcome. Thanks, Wilson. I'm sure they, they still have a lot of questions for you, but uh, we're quite pressed with time. So again, on behalf of the School of Architecture Building and Design, we would like to thank you or Architect Wilson for, I know you're quite busy also, Okay, uh, for taking a time off uh, joining us for this lecture. Okay. okay. You're welcome. Okay. It was a pleasure. <laughs> okay. yeah. We hope to see you for the final review. Okay, I'm sure uh, Wicket will be inviting you. <laughs> sure. Thanks, Susan. Yeah. yeah, and, and uh, as I said, you know, I think the talk was not to discourage, but to encourage to say that look, it, it can be done. Uh, you just got to have a clear idea and you just got to work bloody hard for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was very encouraging. Yeah, probably we can uh, have, before we end the session for today, uh, Jesse, are you here? Uh, our hardworking class rep, uh, Jesse. Probably we can do a group photo before, before we end. So I would like to ask everyone to switch on their camera so our guest speaker will see you. We'll see you all. Uh, uh, the beautiful and good-looking students of Taylor's University, semester six. Guys, Jesse, are you here? I think, okay, I can see Jesse with the, Jesse and company. Yeah. So I'll take the group photo now. So everybody turn on your camera. Come, come. <laughs> okay, let's give another five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I'll just take now.
Okay, thanks, Jesse. Okay. Again, once again, thanks, Architect Wilson. Okay. Thank you, Wilson. Welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, you may proceed with your tutorials. Thank you, Prince. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, thanks everyone.